Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A plus certification training course. This module is Introduction to Networking. In this module, we're going to look at the requirements from our CompTIA exam 220-601, section 5.1 where we need to identify the fundamental principles of networks. We're going to talk about all kinds of basic networking concepts in this module. We're going to talk about addressing bandwidth status indicators. We're going to go through what a network is, and that means what the topology is, how the cabling works, and some very common networking models. We're going to talk about also what bandwidth is, how duplex is applied into networking, We'll talk about IP addressing and addressing in general, and we'll talk about protocols and how they're used in networking. Today we use the term networks to mean many different things, but a network is very simply a way to connect devices together. This can be over copper wires. It could be using fiber connections. And these days, wireless networks are all the rage. So even wireless radio signals are used to connect different computers to each other. The idea is that these are connected through some very common topologies. One that you hear very often are things like Ethernet, wireless networks, Wi-Fi, 802.11. We'll talk about what some of these things are in this module and in some others. But keep in mind that these are standards. These are ways that everybody has decided upon that this is how we're going to connect all of these machines to each other. And because we're following these standards from this Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE, since we're using those IEEE standards, that means that everybody can build equipment, hardware, and software to all interoperate and work together. The network is now also part of the operating system. This wasn't always this way. You used to have to add on different modules to software, different add-ons from third parties just to be able to network an operating system. But these days, Microsoft Windows and every almost every other operating system you're going to find out there has networking built into the very kernel of the operating system. These days, it's very difficult to figure out exactly where the network stops and the operating system begins. And that's by design. You want everything to be very seamless. And the networking has allowed us to really take our individual computers and expand their reach out very widely. The integration of networking hasn't been just on our operating system. It's also on the motherboard. Here's a picture of one of my motherboards. And we have the very common parallel ports and serial ports and video connections. But notice right on the motherboard are also network connections. These are two on this particular motherboard. This motherboard was designed to be a server, so it just doesn't have one connection out to the, the network that it's connected to. There are two connections here. And that can be done for many different reasons. But it's just another example of how what these days we expect there to be a network cable or some type of network connectivity integrated into the hardware that we use. At its fundamental level, we have to connect our networks together in some way. And one of the more common ways is a term called Ethernet. Ethernet is a networking topology that uses copper wire. It's used by routers and firewalls. If you have a cable modem or a router or a firewall or an access point in your home, you probably have Ethernet connections on those. It's a very common and very inexpensive way to network. And so it is almost used almost everywhere. Every major organization, every minor organization, every small company, and even in our homes these days usually has connectivity that's connected via Ethernet. Another type of networking that's becoming extremely popular is wireless networking. You'll hear this referred to as Wi-Fi, WLAN. And it uses these IEEE standards, that IEEE 802.11a, 802.11b, 802.11g, or 802.11n. When you're buying a piece of wireless technology, you'll notice it has one of those standards or sometimes multiple versions of those standards written right on the box so you know which standard this particular piece of hardware conforms to. You see this very often in consumer networking, but we're also seeing it quite a bit in enterprise networks, very large networks. The challenge for large organizations is because this is radio waves that can really transcend the building. It can go outside to the parking lot even. There are security concerns associated with that. So not every organization has wireless, but it's really perfect for a consumer environment or a place where you really need mobility that gets beyond using wires to connect to the network. Networking isn't only about connecting devices up, but it's about connecting them up and moving data very quickly. The different topologies that we just mentioned all transmit data at different speeds. So occasionally, especially if you're sending a lot of traffic, you're watching a video right now, 
you need a lot of bandwidth. The video uses a lot of bandwidth, and the more speed you have on your network, the faster you're going to be able to receive that data. We usually describe bandwidth in bits per second. So as we go through this, this particular video and many others on networking, you'll very often hear these networking topologies described as bits per second. This is a little bit different than we're talking about data that's stored on a hard drive where everything is usually talked about in bytes. But in the networking world, we always use bits per second to describe speeds and bandwidth. There are some topologies that communicate in both directions at the same time, something called full duplex. And there's also a technology called half duplex, where one side speaks at a time. I'll show you more about duplexing in this module, and we'll actually go into your Windows configuration. And I'll show you where you can see some of those settings. Ethernet has been around for quite some time, and so there's many different speeds of Ethernet, very many different ways to connect it together. You'll see most common Ethernet is going to run at 100 megabits per second, but there are some legacy pieces of gear out there that run at 10 megabits per second. The latest versions of Ethernet are running at very high speeds, gigabits per second. There is a gigabit Ethernet that runs at 1,000 megabits per second. That's a gigabit. And the latest versions of gigabit run at 10 gigabits gigabit per second or 10,000 megabits per second. So the idea whenever people talk to you about Ethernet, they say, oh, what, what are you running? Oh, I'm running gigabit Ethernet. Usually on some of our newer laptops and devices, it's a gigabit Ethernet connection. But you have to make sure on the other side of that connection, on your firewall, your cable modem, that it also will support that speed. Ethernet, fortunately, will drop its bandwidth down so that both sides match up at the fastest speed possible. It's not always the case, but that's the idea. Is we're able to run as quickly as possible, and it could be an option between any one of these types of connections. Wireless is also very similar in that there are many different kinds of wireless connections. I mentioned that 802.11a, b, g, and n type connectivity. And I've got here some descriptions of possible throughputs that you could have, maximum throughputs that you could have for these wireless technologies. Wireless is a little bit different than a wired connection because so many things can affect a wireless signal, the distance you are from your access point. Uh, if there's any other interference in your area, all of these things can start to affect how the signal is getting to you, how, how you're able to hear the signal from the network, and how much you're able to transmit back without there being problems and retransmissions and data that's dropped along the way. And those types of things can slow down the signaling. But if we're talking about the maximum total throughput of these wireless connections, here's an example of what you might see. And on the exam, you might get a question about what is our maximum theoretical throughput for an 802.11g network. And you'll need to know that that's 54 megabits per second. In networking, we hear the term duplex quite a bit. There are half duplex and full duplex connections. Half duplex is a system where one station talks at a time. This is very similar to a phone call you might have where one person talks, they stop talking, and then the other person communicates. And really, only one person can talk at a time. Whenever two people are on the phone trying to communicate, neither one of them can hear very well. So you want to keep that a half duplex conversation. This is what was used in legacy networking equipment because the hardware inside of those devices could really only do one thing at a time. Since then, our technology has gotten better, and we've gotten to more of a full duplex communication. This is where both stations can send data and receive data simultaneously. They don't have to be like a person on the telephone. They can talk, and at the same time, while they're talking, they can receive information. As you, as you might imagine, that's a much more efficient communication. You can send data a lot faster because you don't have to wait while one station is communicating. The real key here with networking is the duplex has to match on both sides. For most technologies, Ethernet's a good example of this, the duplex communication capabilities are auto-negotiated whenever a link starts up. Most of the time, that works just fine. But there are some people that say they want to lock it down, and, and they want to administratively say that both sides of this communication are running at full duplex or running at half duplex. But the key is that you want to match those. You can imagine if one station continues to talk over another and the other station is set to half duplex and isn't expecting that, that errors can occur and throughput will drop very dramatically. So duplex, a very minor type thing. You set it up and it runs, but it can create major problems for you if it's set incorrectly. Let's look at the duplex settings for my computer. I'm going to go to my Start menu choose Settings, and all of our networking is in the Control Panel. There's a selection in the Control Panel for Network Connections. And if I double click that, that will list for us all of the networking connections that are configured on this device. Now, I'm running from a virtual machine, so I have one Ethernet connection out to my local area network, and it's currently connected. 
What we'd like to do is get more information about the raw configuration of this hardware. We want to see exactly how we've configured this device. And if I right mouse click, one of my options is Properties. This brings up a local area connection properties dialog box that gives us information not only about what adapter, what physical hardware adapter that we're using in this device, but there's some other connections and protocols down here. We'll look at the protocols in just a bit. Right now, where I'd like to focus is on our duplex setting, and all of that is configured in the hardware device itself. So I'm going to click Configure. The next option that comes up is a set of resources and information that's available for this piece of hardware that we have. And we can see that we've got a general tab, an advanced tab, a driver tab, and resources. All of the configurations and settings for this piece of hardware are always under the advanced tab. And what's interesting about this is that if you look at the advanced tab on your piece of hardware for your adapter of your network card, you may have different settings in there. Different pieces of hardware will support different options. In mine, there is a full duplex option that allows me to set different configurations depending on what port I might be plugged into. I can turn this off, which means that it is half duplex, or I can turn it on and use the adapter setting or force it into using a specific type of interface on my Ethernet card. The two interfaces I have are a UTP interface and an AUI interface. So it's very easy to go in and make changes to this and adjust it. If you think you might be having problems with duplex or you want to be sure that they're set correctly on both sides, you can go into your advanced tab and see how it's set on one side, check the other side, make sure they match up. Now that we've confirmed that our hardware is working properly, we have to assign to our computer an address. This is very much like an address you might have on a house or apartment building. People would not be able to mail you anything. They would not be able to find out where you live unless you provide them with that address. Well, it's the same way with your computer. You have to assign an address for your computer so that the other computer across the network or across the internet knows how to get back to where your device is. This is very often seen, the most common type of addressing that we see is TCP IP addressing. That's a type of protocol that's used to communicate. And this is stands for Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol. This is a protocol that's used internationally. It's used on the internet as the primary protocol. And there's a couple different versions of this. The one that's been in use for years is one called TCP IP version 4. Whenever you look at the configuration of your systems today, you're probably using a version 4 address. An emerging version is called TCP IP version 6. Version 5 was sort of jumped right over. So version 6 is now the latest generation of TCP IP networking. Some of the largest organizations in the world, some of our uh, the US government, for instance, is in the process of implementing IPv6. But it's not very widespread right now. You'll start to see more IPv6 addressing come out. But for the purposes of our CompTIA exam and understanding networking, we're going to focus on TCP IP version 4. When you start working with TCP IP version 4 addressing, you're going to see some very common addressing schemes here, something that's used on every single device you go to. This is three major things that you'll need to be able to network a device. You will need an IPv4 address. This is your street address, your house address, if you will. You will need a subnet mask, and you will need a gateway. The TCP IP version 4 address is one that we call uh, is very often used in something we call dotted decimal notation, which means it's four numbers with a period between them. Your numbers might be 192.168.0.1. That's a TCP IP address. So any number between 0 and 255 can be one of those numbers inside of that address. We're looking at them in decimal. Your computer looks at them very differently. But from a human being perspective, it's nice to have that decimal type. And whenever somebody's asking you, what is your TCP IP address? That's what they're wanting to hear. They're wanting to hear that 192.168.0.1, or whatever your address is. Being able to provide somebody with that address in binary or hexadecimal is not very human friendly. We also need something called a subnet mask. The IP address and the subnet mask work together, because the subnet mask is going to determine which network segment you're on. The idea behind the subnet masking and the details about exactly how it works is a little bit out of scope for the TCP IP section of our exam, of the CompTIA exam. But the subnet mask is a critical piece of this. You cannot network on a network, generally speaking, unless you have your address and your subnet mask. And also, the third piece that you're going to need is a gateway. The gateway is the IP address of the router that your machine uses to communicate out to the rest of the world. 
So if you're in a home network, your address, your gateway address is probably pointing out to your cable modem or your router. You also can see that the gateway address becomes extremely important because we have to be able to get out of our house to communicate to anything else. So if we did not have our gateway address, we would only be able to communicate within the network that's within our home on that single subnet. And obviously, when you're connecting to the internet, the gateway becomes a critical piece of this. Let's look at the addressing configuration in my computer here. I'm back in my local area connection properties. We got to this from our control panel under our network connections option. And you can see there are a number of connections that come by default in our Windows configuration. I'm going to scroll down a bit because one of those connections here is the internet protocol, TCP IP. That's exactly what we were just talking about. And if I choose properties, it pulls up information about how this device is configured. On most devices, even in very large organizations, this tends to be the default configuration. Notice that it will obtain an IP address automatically, and it will obtain a DNS server address automatically. We'll talk more about DNS in just a moment. We can also specify what the IP address is on this device if we'd like to. And there are those three very critical pieces we just talked about. There's the IP address, the subnet mask, and the default gateway. Without these three devices, we can't really communicate out on the internet and do anything that's really functional. The DNS configuration also uses that same dotted decimal notation. We'll talk more about why DNS is important in a bit. But we're going to, in our particular case, say that we're going to continue to obtain these addresses automatically. So the question becomes, what are we configured for on this device? Well, what we're going to do is go to the command line. If you remember using the command line with some of the utilities in a previous module that we did, we get to the command line using start run and typing CMD and hitting Enter. What I'm going to type is a command called ipconfig. ipconfig will become a very important command if you start to do a lot of things with networking in Windows because it tells you a lot about what's running on your system. And if I type ipconfig, I can see my connection and my DNS suffix. We'll return to what that is in just a moment. But the three critical pieces, my IP address, my subnet mask, my default gateway. My IP address is 192.168.0.11. My subnet mask is 255.255.255.0, and your default gateway is 192.168.0.1. So our subnet mask determines what network we're on. Our default gateway is pointing out to a third device that's outside of our system called 192.168.0.1. Now, notice that the IP addressing is a bunch of numbers all jumbled together. It's very easy to mix these up to get them wrong. So it's important if you're ever configuring an IP address, just make sure you do a double check on these devices. Even if you are receiving this information from someone else, you can see why it would be important to repeat that back to them to make sure you get this right. Let me make sure I got the subnet mask. It's 255.255.255.0. And they would say yes or no. So this is a very common way to communicate with networking addressing. It's something as you use more and more TCP IP addressing and you work more with it, it almost becomes second nature. TCP IP is a protocol. And it's very important when we start talking about networking that we understand more about protocols. Now, when we created this network, we talked about it being a phone line where two people were talking on the phone. You can think of the protocol as being the language that those two people are speaking. If a person on one end of the phone was speaking French and the other person on the other end of the phone was speaking German and neither of them understood the other language, they wouldn't be able to communicate very properly. That's why we've all decided if we're going to run TCP IP on one side of a communication that we also need to run TCP IP on the other. That's one very common example of a protocol. But there are other protocols that are used, occasionally multiple protocols within a single computer that are used to communicate back and forth between devices. Most languages, most protocols are very well known. You'll very rarely these days see a protocol that is proprietary, that only certain systems will run, because it's very easy for developers to write their applications to use these very common protocols. So you'll see protocols such as TCP IP, which are very common and very open. You'll also see very network-centric protocols from companies that have designed network technologies. Microsoft has their own suite of protocols that's used to be able to 
to communicate to Microsoft products. Apple also has a number of, of protocols that they've created that allow Apple products to communicate back and forth. And Cisco, a very common networking company, has protocols that it has created. So you will find that when you start working with technologies like this, very large companies that create these networking products, there is probably a subset of protocols that are very network-centric that are used primarily for those devices to communicate uh, between each other or from those devices to you. But it's usually not something as widespread as TCP IP. But it's still important that you understand that your workstation has to know that protocol to be able to communicate with those devices. There are also protocols used by applications. Some very good examples of this. Web browsers have their own protocols that allow the web browser to talk to the web server. Ma mail clients have their own protocol that allow mail servers to communicate uh, from one place to another or allow your mail client on your machine to talk to the mail server. We'll also see very application-centric protocols with operating systems and the way that they use files across the network. So you can see there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different protocols that are being used every day out on our networks. And it can be a challenge to understand exactly how every single one of them works. But if you get into networking, you do a lot more with networking technologies, you're going to find yourself becoming more and more familiar with very, very large amounts of these protocols running on the network. In review, we've given you an overview of networking. We've looked at network topologies. We've looked at what a cabling configuration or even a lack of cabling configuration can do for your network. And we've discussed a number of networking models that you'll see out there in the world. We've looked at bandwidth, duplex. We've discussed IP addressing. And finally, we discussed how a protocol is used in a networking environment. For more free a videos, you can participate in our message boards with other a professionals, or to participate on our wiki, you can visit our website, freeaplus.com.